This is now looking at sort of beyond PSMA. Now thinking about like what are potentially some of the mechanisms of, of resistance that might be underlying some of the variations in response that we might see to treatment with lutetium-177 PSMA. Oliver, why don't I start with you first, um, talking now about um, some of the limitations of lutetium-177 PSMA, because I think it, as this rolls out into the community, we're going to treat patients and, and we're going to see some responders, but they're going to be some non-responders, some limited responses uh, in patients. And, and that's just a fact of any therapy, as, as you stated earlier. Give me your sort of overview thoughts on, on what might be, you know, driving some of the um, refractory biology and nature uh, in these patients and, and what might we be thinking and looking for in patients who are at risk for non-responsiveness? Yeah, great, great question. And, and, you know, we're still working through this, of course. I mean, it's, it's all still pretty new. Uh, one thing is, I, I think I've created in my own mind what I call a hierarchy of badness. And the, at the at the bad end of the bad are, are the liver mass, particularly large liver mass. And, you know, I, I can pretty much say across the board, you know, large liver mass are bad news. But we just didn't see a lot of good activity in large liver mass. So on the other hand, you know, for lymph nodes, we saw some really dramatic responses. I mean, some lymph nodes that were, you know, quite large could just shrink all the way back down to normal. If you actually look at the CRPR rate, remember these highly refractory patients, uh, the CRs were about 9%, PRs about 42. So CRPR by resist criteria was actually over 50%, it was about 51%. I think it's extraordinarily high. If you compare that to things like cabaraterone or cabazitaxel in this refractory patient population, you know, it's, it's down below 20%. So it's a big response rate, but a lot of those are lymph nodes. One of the other things we talked about a little bit earlier was the heterogeneity of the patients. Well, yes, the patients are heterogeneous, but also even the lesions within a patient have heterogeneity as well. Some lesions have a lot of PSMA uptake and some don't. And you can actually sort of go lesion by lesion and sort of predict the response. You know, these high PSMA uptake lesions are the ones that are going to respond pretty well and the ones that are lower are typically not going to do so well. And then I'm going to venture off into, you know, different lands. We didn't really evaluate things like FTG PET in the vision trial, but the Australians have shown us that FTG uptake is poor prognosis. And they quoted the therapy trial, which had both cabazitaxel and the PSMA lutetium in it. It doesn't matter what you're being treated with. You got a lot of FTG uptake. That's a bad sign. Those are very aggressive tumors. And then as we speculate more, talk about the underlying genomics, you know, what about P53 mutations, what are B mutations, what about things like prior treatment with DNA damaging agents like platinum? There's so much to explore here. But I'll simply say today, there is a hierarchy and the liver lesions are the ones that seem to be the most difficult. And the ones that have a lot of PSMA uptake seem to respond best. And perhaps that's intuitively obvious, but that's sort of where I am now in my own understanding. Great, great, great advice, great yeah. insights on this. And Raina, what, what are your thoughts yeah. on it? I would, I mean, I would agree. I mean, I think it also comes back to the molecular underpinnings of what's happening as, you know, tumors evolve during the CRPC course under the various selective pressures of treatment and thinking about, you know, lineage plasticity with the emergence of sort of a neuroendocrine phenotype that we're beginning to see in like 15 to 20% of patients with advanced disease, you know, you would hypothesize that those patients are probably not going to respond um, to therapy and probably have tumors that express little P, uh, PSMA. And there's also this emergence of you know, what's been coined sort of this double hit of neuroendocrine negative, AR negative um, molecular phenotype with prostate cancer and, and suspect that those patients may not necessarily be responsive. I think thinking about strategies to overcome resistance, it's strategies where how can we actually induce PSMA expression potentially, um, you know, thinking of combining it with another agent, um, uh, where you can actually modulate the PSMA expression and what's the best timing, you know, especially as we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but as we move into the hormone sensitive setting where people are getting ADT, where things are treated, where you may be modulating down PSMA expression, 
how does that modulation affect um, response and resistance? So I think, I think there's a lot to learn about, um, you know, in the genomics um, for both PSMA AVID, PSMA non AVID, and FDG AVID, and actually looking at the molecular signatures of each of those three imaging, you know, uh, clinical phenotypes um, would be really cool. Really cool, absolutely, absolutely. And there's one other factor, I, I, you know, for us to consider in this, and that is sort of volume of disease, you know, size of tumors and, and volume of disease, because, uh, you know, we see this time and again that the higher volume tumors are, are harder to treat. And, you know, this is a radiation therapy at the end of the day. We would anticipate that these, 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 these larger volume, higher, uh, bigger volume sized individual lesions would be, would be harder to treat than some of the smaller lesions. Any data from that, Oliver, from the vision side you're aware of? You know, I, I can't recall data from vision, but, but then I agree with you, you know, and I think it's related to the heterogeneity, the molecular heterogeneity. As these tumors expand, there's just more possibilities that they'll not reflect the original lineage. You know, we, we, we talk about trunkal aberrations and then the branches and then, you know, the leaves. And as you expand that tumor size, you're talking about the opportunity for uh, tumors to be derived further away from their trunkal origin, if you will. Um, and as, as we create the, and I like the way Raina, you know, talked about it in the plasticity, we're using this incredible selective pressures when we're applying things like ADT, abiraterone, enzalutamide, taxanes. And remember these patients were exposed to all those previously. Just imagine how the tumor begins in the body when it may have been initially found in the prostate and what it ends up when we're actually treating with PSMA lutetium and all the therapies that exert that selective pressure and the mutations that arise and the resistance patterns that arise. I mean, I'm pretty amazed that it turned out to be a positive trial on these patients who were so heavily pretreated because this is not your grandfather's prostate cancer. This is like a whole new prostate cancer. Raina mentioned you know, importantly about these different patterns, these neuroendocrine patients that are emerging. But you know, we used to see those kind of once in a blue moon. Now I see them all the time. And I think what we're doing is we're treating that traditional adenocarcinoma, that traditional AR dependency. We're wiping out those cells, but the cells that emerge later, oh boy, those are the tough ones. So we've got a work cut out of us in order to show further improvements. It's not just going to be hitting AR harder. Now we got to understand new pathways, new resistance patterns, and apply new technologies to be able to overcome that resistance. So it's it's a challenge today. Yeah, absolutely, a lot to learn, and I, I do feel like we're still at the beginning stages of this yeah. of this journey. And uh, vision was was really just just the first step. I I think there'll be a lot more, and that really leads us to our our last section, which is uh, I think you know the the current uh, landscape of of treatments with PSMA. Uh, and we'll talk about that next. Well, I, I can't thank you all enough for uh, this, this really interesting, uh, I think, you know, uh, inspiring discussion around uh, lutetium 177 PSMA and the potential rollout of this in the near future and, and what implications we have for this year and, and, and things to look forward to in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. And uh, on behalf of my uh, roundtable uh, colleagues, thank you all for listening today.